Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mac Gamecast episode 43. It's been a little while. We're back. We have our fantastic host, as always. It's Mr. Casper from Denmark, unless I'm crazy. And yeah, yeah, no, just... I, I have, I've not moved out of the country. I'm still from Denmark. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, that's that's what I thought. It's, sometimes I mix up my Nordic countries, which is terrible, but I'm, you know, I'm an American who's yeah. bad at geography, so I hope you can be uh, a break. Sure. But enough about me. It's all about Mr. Sam today. How you doing? Good, yeah, thank you. Good to be here. It's been a little while. It mm-hmm. has, it On has. Your today. presence is always more than welcome. We have a bunch of stuff, quick high-level overview um there's iphone events there is new mac game releases um i mean that's the main thing stuff about mac gaming mac porting releases the hardware um what else may be possible m3 chips inbound stuff like that was more Mm -hmm. or less the the target of today's show and we'll see where it gets us um we might as well start kind of chronologically which would be the iphone 15 event right i think so yeah well you are more on top of that than me or maybe both of you so maybe you want to take over (laughs) yeah sure Uh, i can say some things sam feel free to jump in at any point but um so the event started with the apple watch uh being talked about um they showed off a series 9 i would say it's pretty incremental improvements from the series 8 um, a noteworthy change that the, for the first time in quite a while, uh, the actual chip inside the Apple Watch changed. We've had like the basically the same chip for how many generations? Like since the Series Five or Six or something. Um, they they've called it slightly different things. I/O parts have been changed, but the main parts of it have been the same for a while. Um, but of course, with something like the Apple Watch, you've got to ask the question. What can I use the faster chip for? Because, you know, get put a faster chip in a Mac and we have all these use cases that, you know, make them as fast as you can get. But on an Apple mm. Watch, I'm not sure the faster chip matters for the use cases that exist <laughs> right now. Um, but, you know, give developers more power. Thing with the faster chip I thought was a good call I saw was the on-device Siri. Um, yeah i but i don't think that's really the cpu or the gpu power i think that's more the fact that there's a neural engine in there now but that is of course still part of the chip so fair yeah usually i don't care about siri but on the watch siri is Mm. pretty essential oh yeah definitely the fact that you can do things without needing to dig into a lot of menus with you know the interaction mechanism you have there is that's good also, the fact that with the on-device aspect, you can now access sensitive data through Siri that you couldn't before, like health, because they didn't want to talk to the server with that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty neat. Um, I'm just waiting for the uh, Apple Watch Skyrim port. That's all. All oh, right, yeah. It, you can already <laughs> run Doom on it, so <laughs> maybe. Maybe one day. <laughs> um but yeah, there was that. And then they basically took a feature that's existed on Apple Watch since, like, watch show at seven on the series four or something and branded it as a new feature. Uh, so that's, that's interesting. Um, the double pinch to do with quick action. That's been an accessibility feature for quite a while. I have it enabled on my series four or sorry, series eight, but it could have gone back to series four. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming it's more reliable or something and that's the big deal, but that's, yeah, that's the Apple watch basically. My incremental feature. Apple Watch Ultra 2 also happened, but it basically got the same treatment. Small incremental updates. And then, of course, the iPhone 15 got released or announced. Um, So the 15 is basically the same as the 14 Pro. Um, Minor design tweaks, but it's basically an iPhone 14 Pro at a cheaper price. Um, And 15 Pro is getting uh, an A17 Pro chip. So we're moving away from the Bionic name, and I'll have a lot of comments on that in a moment. Um, it's getting a new camera system with a Tetra Prism um, zoom lens that's you know giving you the equivalent of uh, 5x zoom relative to the main sensor or main lens. Um, and what else happened on the 15 Pro? I mean, it's made of titanium. Does anybody... USB-C would be the other big one. But. Right, yeah, there's USB-C now, mm. um, which, you know, as some have predicted, the USB-C port on the base 15 limited to USB 2 speeds, so it's the same mm. speed as Lightning. Fortunately, the actual 15 Pro gets USB 3, 
10 gigabits, I think. Um, also has display port for 4K, 120 hertz, all that jazz. So yeah. we'll be getting into that in that in a moment, in a bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's like the big highlights from the event. Um, I think, um, unless I'm missing anything important, but I think that's it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, every year I have a series five Apple watch every year. I'm hoping for like the inevitable redesign. Um, I've heard is, series 10 is the point where it, that's yeah. what they keep saying. So hopefully the ultra is like, I think the ultra is the redesign and then they'll move that design to like the more. Entry level I really hope not because I really don't like the look of the Ultra. <laughs> well, I don't think they'll they'll port it like one for one, but kind of that more like a little bit more squared design. But they'll make yeah, it I don't like, like that. thinner. I, the Ultra is like so thick. Yeah. Um, like it, I've tried it on the Apple Store and I just, I just can't do it. It's too big. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, I have tiny wrists, so for me, it would be out of the yeah. question. Yeah. So like, I have a Series Five. It it's. It's plugging along. I think I'm at 70% battery health now. So I keep mm. hoping for a, a reason to upgrade. But, um, and the iPhone 15 actually bought a 15 plus, used it for a week, and then I returned it, not because I didn't like the phone. Um, I have a 13 mini as my yeah. current phone. So I went to the plus to almost assuming I would want to return it, but I wanted to try out the, yeah, what is it, 6.8 inch or whatever the screen size I is. I think 6.7, I want to say. Yeah. So it was really nice, um, but I just, I think I'm going to order a 15 Pro, I think. I just yeah. couldn't do the plus slash max uh, size. To, to me, it's an advantage with the Pro model that it has slightly slimmer bezels and a slightly smaller footprint than the, you know, base 15. It's a tiny bit, but I, I want smaller. <laughs> I would have bought a mini if that was a possibility, but. Yeah. yeah, I love my 13 mini. I love how like one handed it is like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I used it for a few days. It was a really nice phone. I actually was pleasantly surprised at the screen, how good it looked on the 15 plus. Cause I'm, I really want the 120 Hertz on the pro. Yeah. I think it just looks so much nicer, but I knew it was 60 Hertz on the plus. I got like, I consciously knew that. And when I was like scrolling it and I still didn't mind it, I thought it was still yeah. nice. My mini obviously has 60 Hertz, but. But at least um, the 15 lineup now also has the super retina XDR thing. So it has like the super wide XDR range. So yeah, it looks, I think it looked a lot better visually than my mini. Like I'm not, obviously the screen size is one thing, but just, yeah, just looking at the screen, like the colors popped harder and everything. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. I'm still on an iPhone SE. So <laughs> like the third <laughs> generation, but yeah. Yeah. S small phones. <laughs> I've just got an iPhone 13, but. Works great. I'm not trying to game on it. But speaking of gaming on phones, so about two weeks ago, <clears throat> September 15th, Apple did this interview with IGN, maybe other places, but IGN seemed to be the main one, where they're like, this is going to be the best game console, the iPhone 15 mm -hmm. Pro, based on its A17 chip and six core GPU and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so, I mean, what what does I did? I honestly, I didn't read the whole interview. I was just skimming it. Um, but basically what do you guys think of that as a possibility? Like, is it any, does it have any potential to compete in this mobile, like smaller console market? Is it exclusively really meant to rather than gaming on your phone, plug in to an external display and like play with a controller? Like, what do you think? Cause you know, they're bringing bigger AAA games soon, like next mm. week, some of them are starting to arrive, for example. I don't know. Let's. Yeah, I think um, the biggest issue the iPhone has when it comes to trying to be a gaming console um, is the fact that the native input mechanism is touch. Um, and I think if, like, the problem is that games on the App Store need to support touch as an input mechanism to be allowed on the App Store because you need to be able to play it on your iPhone without anything else. And if games like have to support touch as a first class citizen, then that really limits the input complexity that it can have, or at least the pleasant, you know, gaming experience of the input. And you're, if you do play with touch, you're going to be covering up a fairly a sizable portion of the screen with your fingers. Um, you can't react fast. The games need to take it, like take that into account and everything. Um, Maybe the, the big AAA games won't take that into account, but then you're also looking at like you, you can barely be um, getting a good experience if you're using touch and all this. 
if you plug in a controller, I do think, you know, fine, that could be a good solution. It could effectively be something similar to a Nintendo Switch. It's far more po powerful than a Nintendo Switch. Um, and if you have, you know, a docking situation where you can plug it into a, a USB-C port, get like display port out and plug it into a telly, you have effectively the same experience as a Nintendo Switch, but more powerful if the games are there and you can have a controller. But are people really going to do that is my question. Like, I, I don't know. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, it's it's an interesting thought. And I know the Apple execs or or phone execs in general love to tout like iOS is the world's most popular gaming platform or like Android. It's the same thing. But mm -hmm. like everybody knows that it's like, OK, let's not really what anybody means when they talk about gaming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like the power thing that Caster mentioned, certainly. Like the iPhone is is beyond capable from a performance standpoint. Like a Nintendo Switch is ancient by by performance standards, but the performance as we see with the Switch isn't really mm -hmm. what makes a, a good gaming platform. Um, the Switch is like, I think it's is it more powerful than a PS4 from 2013, or is it? Weird? I think it's about the same level, honestly, but I don't yeah. know. Um. So that's like that's ten year old hardware, and the Switch is like on par with that. And what we saw with like Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild, and still releasing like Metacritic topping titles like pretty yeah. consistently year after year. Um, so the, the Apple could certainly chase that. It, they're not going to do it this year, I think, for the only reason being that they've intentionally decided to segregate their lineup, where you have to buy the 15 Pro to get some of these new AAA titles. Mm -hmm. um, the 15 Pro is better. It has a few more pieces of tech in it, like the ray tracing and stuff. But I don't know if ray tracing is even going to be enabled in those titles. Maybe it will be. Um, um, I think the main limitation from a uh, device standpoint from the 15 to run these games is that the uh, hardware for the GPU um, metal effects upscaling is only supported on the A17 Pro. I They said that. Mm -hmm. I think they're doing that arbitrarily because they're supporting yes. it on the M1. Yes. Which is way older, not way older. But, it's, it's but what about the neural old. engine? Because that's also used in Metal FX, and is that powerful enough on the uh, Bionic chip? It's a good question. Like, maybe there's a harder reason. I'm suspecting it's similar to, like, what NVIDIA is doing with, her, with DLSS. Yeah, maybe. And stuff where it's like, this could run on previous gen cards. We're going to mm -hmm. gatekeep some of it to later gen stuff. And I think mm, next it, year, when the 16 and 16 Pro, and then also the old 15 Pro, mm. will all have this like gaming mantra right from release. Because um, the A16 Bionic, if you exclude sort of the more proprietary accelerators, mm -hmm. it's very close. It's like 5 10% slower than an A17. So it's not like it's like a 30 40 50% margin between the two chips. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, but yeah, I agree with everything everybody said about the input method mechanism. I wonder. I don't think Apple will do this, but I I think if they really want to take gaming really seriously, they'd have, almost have to launch a separate app store. I, mm -hmm. I know they have a gaming tab in the current app store, but the app store is just so bloated. And You're so, thinking something similar to how they did like Apple Music and Apple Music Classic. Yeah, just some way to make organic discovery of games way better on the iphone because right now if you're not like in their editor's choice like tab when you open up the app store mm -hmm. good luck getting found mm -hmm. in the app store unless you're like clash of clans or like with those top games that are always there but that brings up the question is it the problem from a gaming perspective or from an everything perspective because i've also heard app developers complain about discoverability well yeah i think i think it's an everything perspective um like a sure, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's a definitely a bit of both. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the apps we've discussed the terrible app store like UI and discoverability before, but um, I think it's a I think it's different because everyone already knows to go look for those apps more mm. like more or less. They're not like, oh my god, can an iPhone use a utility app? Well, of course, there's like twenty different ones for whatever <laughs> you want to do. Right. Um, but the discoverability of games is a different like. Because it's so unsupported by Apple until like, oh, suddenly it's been growing mm -hmm. in the last few years. Uh, I think it is more, what's the word I'm looking for? Pres prescient or something. It's like kind of now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but yeah, if they released, I don't know what they would call it, a, the game store or something. I mean, basic. that would be the natural uh, evolution. You have the app store yeah, and the no. game store. 
Um, and especially because as um, Sam was saying, like it's, it's specifically segregated to this um, I at the moment, iPhone 15 pro and mm-hmm. presumably moving forward, um, with certain games in way, maybe it's M3 only or whatever the ray tracing support is. Right. Um, so my understanding is also that these games that are set to be exclusive to 15 Pro will also come to the iPads with M1 chip and above, just not other interesting. iPhones. Interesting. So I guess the question is, how much does that translate to the, the, the computer chips? Is it the same equivalent support? I would imagine um, so, but yeah, mm. I, there's no confirmation for most of them, I think. so. Right. Yeah. Right. What I'm really curious about with these AAA titles specifically is I want like Digital Foundry or, or somebody similar to do like a deep dive on like frame times and frame rate, like over time, especially because mm-hmm. um, A17 Pro, very powerful. It's got a lot of nice tech for like for the metal effects upscaling and ray tracing and stuff. But it's like if we're on for 45 minutes in to, let's say, yeah. Assassin's Creed Mirage. Um, a, how hot is my phone? I know that's kind of been like a news cycle thing. I don't know how real or not real that is. But then B, like thermal throttling or like battery life will suck, obviously, but that's expected. Hmm. Um, but like just how long can the A17 Pro and let's say a 15 Pro non-max, like that smaller aluminum chassis or titanium, I should say, chassis, hmm. how long can it sustain 30 FPS or will it drop right. to 25, 20, like, I don't know. I, I don't think yeah. Apple would do this if it dropped below 30, like regularly at least. Might be like specific moments, but yeah. Yeah. Um, but like the um, Max Tech did like a thing where they, I think it was a 15 Pro Max. They played Genshin Impact or one of those games for a while and looked at the battery drop. And I think after an hour, they dropped from like 100 to 80. So it was pretty good. So performance or battery wise. Um, but let's uh, the, the overheating thing. Uh, Apple made an unofficial comment on it, so they are, they're actually like acknowledging it. So it, it seems like it's a fairly real thing. Um, they've said that um, it's partially an iOS issue and partially a third-party app issue. Um, according to their statement, it's some apps um, are I don't know using some APIs or something that's unnecessarily um, making their CPU do like effectively turbo boosting in periods where it doesn't need to probably like some quality of service on grand central dispatch that's misconfigured basically telling some background threat to be more aggressive in uh, how important it is to get done and then um, they've said that ios has some bug in it as well that's making it overheat again i'm presuming it's some issue to do with um, how aggressively it should turbo boost for certain tasks or something um, cause like the A17 pro can at peak draw way more power than uh, the 16 bionic. Um, I think we're going from like, what was it? Like eight watts peak on the CPU to like 11, 12 watts and an equal jump up in the GPU, just bigger numbers, I think from 11 to 14 or something. So yeah, peak power draw is bigger, but sustained, uh, performance after you throttle back down to um, sustainable wattage draws is also higher so you know you still win even if it throttles but yeah I find the I, I really like that they're including new I don't like proprietary tech but like new like tech like like the upscaling and the ray tracing and stuff mm-hmm. um, I watched I don't know if you guys caught it it was I forget who it was with it was the cyberpunk developers like CD Projekt and I forgot who was interviewing them, but they were basically talking about because they're obviously partnered with NVIDIA and all their fancy DLSS stuff. Yeah, they were talking about how like the days of like expecting that we should render like a game at 4K full like 38, 40 by 20 by 60 at 120 frames per second and redraw every single pixel of every frame every second. They're like, that's a nice thought, but it's like we can do so much cooler stuff if we use like upscaling and and, and like these accelerators Mm -hmm. to our advantage um and obviously like i would everybody prefers native but like in in real life you can't Mm -hmm. or real world i should say it's really hard to tell the difference if you're not specifically looking for it like i've used Mm -hmm. i have an nvidia card my pc the dlss looks awesome i've had amd cards fsr looks awesome i haven't 
I'm curious how metal effects will look, but I assume. I mean, the, there's hard. been some uh, titles already out with metal effects, and so far, I would say it looks somewhere in between FSR and DLSS in yeah. quality. Re Village, I think, uses it. Yeah, it does. Is it open to all the uh, M series chips? Yeah, like every not, single M series has M2. M series has it, and I think some Mac chips that aren't Apple Silicon can even make use of it. But like some older Radeon chips. Yeah, don't quote me on that one. I I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head, but I think they can some of them. Um, but yeah, they yeah, can't use all cool. of the metal features. Um, in the metal FX package, but they can do the upscale, I think. The only thing I was mildly disappointed on is I know metal FX has existed for a while, but I wish mm-hmm. AMD, Apple, and Intel would just sit down and figure something out because they all have their own yeah. upscaler. Um, <laughs> they all, they all claim now, yeah. is open source. So it's like, let's just figure out one of your guys. And that's all yeah, but I mean, like you, you can use FSR on both Apple Silicon and uh, the Radeon based Macs. Uh, there's again a few things out there that use FSR on those. I don't know if anything that uses Intel X E X what is it X E S S yeah uh, on on Mac, but I do. There's a few things that use FSR, but yeah, yeah, yeah from like a R and D standpoint, I wish they would team up. Yeah, um, definitely. So that they could just have like one product that's awesome instead of like three products that are good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Um, <clears throat> I've been playing Cyberpunk lately due to the big 2.0 patch, which is insanely good. The expansion, which is even better. Um, and I've been mucking around with my settings because there's the um, CD Projekt was the first to add the Ray reconstruction tech from NVIDIA mm-hmm. um, into Cyberpunk via the Red Engine. Of course, their future games use Unreal Engine 5, but for now they're still in Red Engine. So I was mucking around with that. Um, I swear some people said it was supposed to improve performance. Maybe I was crazy. Anyway, Adding it on does look better, but I think my frames dropped by 5 to 10, depending on the scene. Um, um, it should improve performance if you're already using path tracing, which is the more advanced version of ray tracing. Well, I turned them both on, but honestly, the settings are kind of confusing because one's at the top and one's at the bottom of the yeah. settings. But then one locks out the other, so I had to kind of like scroll back and forth, like, wait, right, which yeah. one's enabled now? Because I couldn't see but, it. But if you weren't already using path tracing, performance is expected to go down. But if you were using path tracing, ex- performance will go up. Uh, no, I, I wasn't. It was the first time enabling both, because I was also just enabled, I think, in the DLS 3.5 update driver or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have a 3080 Ti. The game still runs good. So with I, if I don't have also the like DLSS on, the, the upscaler, I mm-hmm. think because I'm running at 4K, like ultra psycho ray tracing, I think my frames are like 25 to 30. Mm-hmm. But then if I enable the upscaler, it jumps to like 50 to 60, depending on the scene yeah. in the game. Yeah. But then I turned on the extra ray tracing, ray reconstruction stuff, and that dropped like, so now I'm probably my average like 45 now. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the game but looks like- insanely good, so I don't really care about the frame drop. But like exactly what um, Sam said about that interview with Cyberpunk and Nvidia and that, like, the, ob- as, as set, obviously it's better to render at native resolution. But if the trade-off is, are we rendering at native resolution on low settings, or are we rendering at some lower setting and upscaling at medium, high, or ultra? Then, I mean, yeah, that's that seems better, right? So, yeah, yeah. The only thing I've noticed that's an issue with it. And I think they'll work on this over time. And this is on the NVIDIA side, not the Apple side. Um, I was trying out Cyberpunk as well. I have a 4070 Ti with the uh, frame generation as well. Nice. Yeah, I don't um, have that. If I crank everything and with DLSS performance, I get like 18 FPS with like Ooh. 4K path traced, like all that stuff. Right. Uh, with frame generation, I can get like closer to 60, but your input lag. You yeah. notice is more in that like 20 FPS area because I'll move my mouse and then it'll kind of be like, I don't mm-hmm. know, that like tenth of a second delay on, on the movement. Um, yeah. But if you are if you have a higher frame rate, it's good. But I wish that game worked a little better on more sane hardware. You kind of need a 4080, yeah, I almost feel like, to play that game. or up. The frame generation stuff is not, it's not, not going to improve input latency. It's, that's always going to stay at your actual render yeah. frame rate. That is an interesting point. I never thought about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I specifically, I did my research and I bought a 3080 Ti because I'm like, 
I'm not playing this game on anything less than this. This is just before the 4080 series came out, but mm. um, yeah, no, it's it's demanding. I mean, the game looks pretty good on lower settings anyway. Honestly, like my buddy plays it on a non ray tracing card. I don't know, he's got a 2060 yep. or 2080 or something. But um, but back to Max stuff. So Lies of P is already out. Mm-hmm. The Pinocchio Souls like game. It's getting pretty solid reviews. Has good Only reviews on the in the App, App Store. store. I think. Correct. Um, But it's just, you know, it's getting good reviews in general, if you'd like it. Um, And it's our first real Souls-like game. I say real because the last one they released was terrible. I forget what even it was called. A hell point I checked since last time. Yeah, something. I thought it was pretty awful. Anyway, Lies of P, pretty cool. Um, Assassin's Creed Mirage is supposed to be coming. So here's what I'm not clear on. It's releasing October 5th, AC Mirage. Um, but you know, for all the platforms, I saw one statement saying it's coming for the iPhone 15 pro on the same date, but then I saw another article that said, oh, that will be in 2024. So maybe they meant Mac support in 2024. I'm a little unclear because mm. obviously it's just around the corner. It's less than a week away. It's like five, six days. Um, so I, I don't know. I didn't dig more into it. I just did some quick searching, but, um, theory coming soon. The first one on Mac since brotherhood correct Casper. i think brotherhood yeah maybe revelations but i think nope. brotherhood never revelations never made it right. ac2 and brotherhood so we skipped ac1 <laughs> mm. got ac2 brotherhood and then we missed the wrap-up game it's so weird revelation was missed because it's part of that whole like story and it's yeah, like it's the yeah, same yeah. engine it's almost everything the same why did they skip that one <laughs> it was annoying yeah they because because it, it wrapped up the game so um mirage is set like 10 or 20 years before valhalla of course, you didn't get ball all on the Mac, but that's the last big AC game. Um, so, and it features a character that shows up in Valhalla. Frankly, his appearance in Valhalla makes zero sense, but mm. <laughs> that's fine. Um, like, why is there like some Middle Eastern, you know, desert assassin guy in the middle of like the snowy Nordic Viking mountains? Be be it make as much sense as taking like the the Viking dude and like going sticking him in the Middle Eastern baghdad or something it's just like what what are you doing here you stick out so ridiculously anyway yeah he's the main character i'm sure it'll be good or at least solid it's more of a return to old assassin creed style um you know i'm a huge fan of the series haven't played everyone played a lot of them um but we'll see you know um if it does come to proper mac uh I, i'm definitely going to check it out i'm pro- I, I don't i'm not into it enough to buy it like on my pc side but okay mm-hmm. here's a question uh, I heard the iPhone 15 version will still be like full price, like fifty, sixty dollars. Yeah, I think so, so. But are they going to enable like a Steam Play sort of thing where you could buy it on your iPhone but also play it on your Mac or vice versa? You know what I mean? Or is it going to be like two separate? Oh, I want to play it on my Mac. I got to pay another sixty dollars. You know, like going by how the App Store usually works. If you buy it on iPhone, you also get it on the iPad, but the Mac is separate. So I don't think so. The uh, the capability is there for them to do that, uh, whether they do it or not. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I really I, hope they do because I don't think so, unfortunately. But I don't know. Yeah, but so it's so it is coming. It's just a matter of when. Uh, AC Mirage, um, and a couple other things. The Division something, but it's not the regular Division games. They're also making the Division three. Right. It's, oh, Division Resurgence. It's a mobile game. So. Yes, the- okay cool but it's a mobile game first not like a game being ported to mobile and there was a fourth game i forget what it was i I think another Uh, resident evil game there's uh, both resident evil's uh, village and four for remake are uh, coming to the iphone 15 pro re4 has also been confirmed as a mac port oh interesting yep um and And death stranding is coming to iphone 15 pro as well yes um it's already on it has a uh what do you call it it has an app store I was just on the App Store. It has an App Store page. Death Stranding says coming December 2nd. Okay. Um, a couple other things. I think Elex 2 is already out. We already mentioned that, I think, last episode. Mm. Fort Solace is coming late October. I think it's October 25th or 30th. Yep. And that's also on the App Store already like coming. So there is no page for AC Mirage. I just looked while we were on the show. So I guess take that what you will. Maybe it isn't releasing next week for iPhone. Maybe it is next year, like I read in one article. It, did they confirm? Well, I guess Apple would never confirm this, but did anybody third party confirm if it's App Store only? 
or like maybe coming to steam like obviously steam would mean you don't get cross purchase but hmm. uh i'm curious if these mac titles will come just to the app store or if so some of them are store. confirmed to be mac store ex- uh, app store exclusive lies of p uh is mac app store exclusive uh i think for it's always was uh the re4 remake i'm pretty sure was confirmed to be mac app store exclusive and that was another one i think i'm not sure but yeah those are at least are mac app store exclusives so it's it seems a lot of it is heading that direction when uh, apple is at least partially involved in it it's probably part of some contract i'm guessing probably so apple yeah. makes their 30 percent cut mm-hmm. yeah so I mean that's what going tying back into the App Store discoverability. Like I think they would have a vested interest in making these games easier to find, easier to see, easier to buy, whatever, as mm-hmm. part of this whole cycle of investment. Let's just call it that um, into bringing more of these games to Mac and getting more developers on board. If you can guarantee a spotlight, like reliably, rather than in the sea of stuff, and like uh, Sam said, editors spotlight or like forget it, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, arguably any big game that comes, they would spotlight, but it's still, it's like, here's Lies of P and AC Mirage and here's like Clash of Clans or whatever. It's all like next to each other. It's incongruous. It's just, yeah, but the, I don't know. the big question is, is it, is it too late? Because like, let's say tomorrow the app store just became the perfect discoverability platform. Like everything was just perfect, right? Whatever that might even mean. Perfect for literally everyone, right? Who checks it? Do you check the Mac App Store ever? Like any of you? Because no, I don't no, check I don't. either of the app stores, like on my phone or my Mac. Yeah, like, right. I can't remember the last time I like organically discovered an app on yeah. iPhone. Like it's always like I saw it on Reddit or like I exactly. knew what I wanted, so elsewhere. I searched for it. And correct. Yeah, yeah it's not so like even if it was great, I wouldn't. I wouldn't around. find out. I actually forget it exists most of the time unless <laughs> something comes up like oh. Like we're talking now and I like go to the app store and like check some release dates mm-hmm. or Mr. Mac, right? Occasionally asked me to go check something in the app store because he's in Australia mm-hmm. and you see different stuff. So it's like, hey, can you go see if this is showing in the NA app store? And I'll, I'll, I'll like, yeah. oh, right, that thing. And go to my applications folder and open it in Ververt. Um, I mean, I, I open the Mac app store when I hear there's an update to pages, keynote numbers or final cut. That's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like <laughs> They could. Right. This is almost like bribery a little bit, but they could compete a little bit and try to get some eyeballs with just running like really nice sales like some of what steam does yeah but that's actually another point because the mac app store basically never has good sales on anything no they never do well Well, they they do occasionally but rarely but if they said like this christmas we're doing like 80 percent off all these like awesome games Mm -hmm. um right get people like into and they keep running that like christmas black friday midsummer sale like um, kind of like an Epic Games strategy. They honestly have really good deals. I've bought some stuff over there because it's like $10, 20 It's mm-hmm. like really cheaper than Steam. And in some cases, it doesn't matter. They um, also have that thing where they just give away free games every now and then. So. They do. Um, did that, you guys sorry. see... Go ahead. I don't I don't want to tangent this, but did you see the news about Epic Games this week? Oh, the uh, uh, lawsuit thing? They li- laid off 16% of their staff and they're like 800 people. It was crazy. hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging cash. Like Tim Sweeney said, like Fortnite costs more money than it brings in. And like, mm-hmm. really? I thought that brought in like three to 400 million a month or something crazy. I'm guessing he's not entirely truthful because I don't see how it's possible they spend that much on development for Fortnite. But well, I wonder, maybe. I, don't know. I wonder if it isn't the development, but rather all the ludicrous licensing they do because they're paying for like oh, yeah. Star Wars, Marvel. Game of Thrones, I don't know what the hell they're paying for. It's like major pop culture IP stuff. Yeah, and, and it also sort of depends how you like music classify. Music stars, and... right? All these huge music stars and dance moves. I don't know what the hell's going on, but I imagine yeah. they're paying a lot of money outside of development just to like bring all this stuff in. But then they also did this thing where they pushed an update to um, the Unreal Engine title, like Unreal Engine for Fortnite, where there was like a separate Unreal Engine that's basically the same Unreal Engine where that you can like, thing, make things yeah. for Fortnite. So is yeah, that yeah, classified yeah. as a development for Fortnite, even that though it thing. has a lot of shared code with Unreal? Like, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's probably like, how they classify expenses as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't see layoffs always as a bad thing, especially if a company's enormous. Like, there has to be some redundancies. That being said, it could also just mean mismanagement. 
It could mean they grew quicker than expected, or maybe they took on too many things at once and realized, oh, hey, this is like too much. We got to scale back to what's more manageable. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm never happy when people lose jobs. That's a bummer. Hopefully, they all land on their feet. But you would but, almost also also think that they would like see some level of growth because of the drama that's also happening with Unity, that more people are jumping ship to oh Unreal, yeah, Ghetto, all that. That could probably be a whole episode in and of itself. Um, yeah. Have you followed that, Sam? Oh, yeah. That's what I thought was interesting. It's like the whole Unity saga. We don't need to get into that here. I don't, we don't, probably don't have time to get into it. But like the you drama with Unity, real briefly. We'll you could just give a quick summary so people listening who may not know know. Unity, how do we summarize this quickly? They surprise altered their pricing scheme to charge per installation, not per purchase, per installation. Um, it looked like it was going to be like retroactive, but it turns out it wasn't. But like the damage was done and like massive out, like in massive, massive drama. Tons of devs came out and speaking against it. And the troubling with engines, I know everybody here knows this, but just for any listeners, you can't just switch game engine. That's like basically recreating your entire game. Um, Maybe in the first few months of your project, you could switch engines without losing crazy amounts of capital. But anything beyond that, you're basically writing off your whole game and starting fresh. Mm -hmm. Um, So developers who are like years into their project have to remain with Unity. And then all of a sudden they kind of got rug pulled with pricing. Mm. Um, and Unity is also not doing well financially. So it's, they kind of have to do this, but it's causing them to do even worse financially. And then, I don't know, the whole, whole thing. Yeah. And just to make it matters even worse, just pr- like moments prior to well, days prior to this happening, the CEO of Un- uh, Unity sold off a lot of shares. So <laughs> great. Apparently, he's with the Not CEO of EA or something. He yeah. was the CEO of EA when they were rated like world's worst company or most yeah, company so, or whatever it was. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I have no particular interest in the Unity engine. I've certainly played games on it. I do prefer Unreal Engine or custom engines like Red Engine or um, Frostbite or whatever. You know, EA uses that. Or, yeah. um, but, you know, obviously, Unity is used by a ton of indie developers and some like AA developers and stuff. I don't know if there's any AAA games on Unity. I mean, um, Unity really has the issue that um, if you have one of their cheaper licenses, you have to have the Unity splash screen that tells everyone, hey, this is a Unity game. Right. But if you buy the more expensive license, you can remove that splash screen, meaning that the shit games that can't afford the expensive license market themselves as Unity games. But the really good games that can afford an expensive license don't tell the customers it's a Unity game. So Unity mm. gets bad reputation. There's right. a there's a bunch of like really big games that use Unity. Um like yeah. it's not so much like the AAA like or quadruple A almost you call it like cyberpunk type stuff, but like like Hearthstone is Unity, um oh, Hollow wow. Knight, um really? Monument mm-hmm. Valley, which I know is, is really popular, Subnautica. Oh, um, those are big, yeah. The Pokemon Pathfinder Go. games I play are Unity. Oh, yeah. interesting. Cities, I think they Skylines. Oh, that's huge too. I think they Rust. power a lot of holy crap, Rust is on Unity. Um, yeah, that's like a mega hit or used to be. Um, I think a lot, I heard a lot of mobile games use unity too. And obviously, too. yeah, yeah. Well, hit our, you know, obviously our opinion on mobile gaming around here is not particularly high. Nonetheless, a bunch of them are out there. People are using them, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, um, oh, yeah, really interesting. Yeah, no, those are all some notable indie hits, uh, mm-hmm. or even mega hits depending, you know, I'll, I'll bring us back on topic. The one thing about all those games coming to iPhone and then by extension, ipad m1 m1 ipads and and max that i i was really proud of especially on this podcast is we talked about this like years ago but like Mm -hmm. on this podcast i wouldn't i wouldn't know what episode that was but how like i think this was apple's strategy and we're finally starting to see it come the strategy being like a single architecture a single like graphics api um across there are three major products like iPhone being the the titan of those products obviously mm-hmm. but iPhone with its hundreds of millions of of active devices out there being like the trojan horse to get these these games onto mac os <laughs> um hopefully it pays off we'll see like i think if if these games if you see like uh like capcom for let's say with resident evil if they announce in like a year from now like oh we sold like a million copies on 
Apple will say as a platform. Mm-hmm. Um, I think other devs will be like, whoa, that's definitely and like a million copies. Isn't a, a million copies on Mac would be crazy, but like a million copies on Mac plus iPad plus iPhone. Mm. I don't think that's a crazy thought. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Mac only. That would be crazy. Or based at this current time, let's say it's a, I wouldn't say improbable. I would say impossible, but collectively that definitely seems possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is what I'm interested at. I agree. I, I mentioned it very br- briefly with Casper before we started recording, like uh, this idea. Yeah, we talked about it years ago and I was feeling pretty happy as well. Like we see it way off in the, in fact, it wasn't even visible. We're like, it's over there, over the sea in the horizon. It's another land and mm-hmm. maybe we'll see it one day. And then like, oh, now it's like, there's a little dot in the horizon. And now I'm like, oh, holy, holy shite. There's like a ship now it's in view. Like it's coming, mm-hmm. coming to land. And choo-choo or whatever like oh well, these games are on it they're going to start arriving and being unloaded theoretically um mm-hmm. not theoretically they are but like I, I guess i'm really interested in this this segregation to me or that's maybe an odd word to use but the you i mean okay it's not unusual you need a particular device to play a game but mm. in other spaces while well, you just need a ps5 or an xbox i can't keep up with the xbox names they drive me crazy the xbox they're crazy 360, 720, XYZ, AUF, GHI, 1, or anyway, mm-hmm. whatever, I'm exaggerating. But you just buy it and you can play it. A PC, well, it's like, well, here's your minimum requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, with the Macs, they're going to start gating them at the M. Well, currently it's M1, but give it a year or two and it might be, well, this game, you need an M2 to play. And say five years from now, it's probably like, oh, a minimum is like an M3 or M4 or whatever the heck it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are, I guess my slight concern is at least on um, like okay how expensive is an iphone 15 pro and an Very. ipad m1 <laughs> exactly so um now apple has a huge fan base or fandom who aren't gamers per se mm. and so as sam was saying well oh there's like hundreds of millions of users potential tar- uh, I was gonna say potential targets that sounds weird potential audience <laughs> a trojan horse was a word used i really like yeah. that um and maybe it could kind of backdoor and then Mac gaming will prosper. And then it's like, uh, what is it? Um, rising water helps all ships or whatever the saying is. High tide raises all ships. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so maybe that could happen and they can kind of help buoy and then feed off each other, you mm-hmm. know, and kind of ping pong around and everything goes up. More exposure, more chatter, you know. Uh, already it's cool. I see like, because I visit game sites a lot. Yeah, IGN, PC Gamer, GameSwap, whatever. They're actually starting to cover this too, which I also find interesting. Because yeah. they normally never mention this stuff. And they're like, oh, here's a big release. And these games, I think I saw on PC Gamer of all places, it was like a standalone article. Like, oh, this game's coming to Mac. You know, and it wasn't like poking fun. It was just reporting on it. So I'm like, oh, well, this is interesting. It's getting out there in the gaming ecosystem, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, one one thing I think, I think with the A17 Pro, I think we're getting a, a taste. And I think, I think we're one, probably more like two years away. Because I think what will happen well, next year, the obvious thing, like this isn't like my prediction, like this is just anybody would know this. Like obviously A17 will be in all the phones next year and maybe an A18. and Well, actually, like it's but. just a naming semantic thing, but I've heard that they're going to do, instead of having an A17 Pro in the baseline and an A18 Pro and a higher end, it's just going to be A18 and A18 Pro, but it's right. basically going to be the A17 Pro in a different yeah. name. So, so mm-hmm. next year is when all the phones get, this capability and and like we're moving we're dropping the pro gateway and then what we also might have in the next 12 to 24 months is a new apple tv with maybe an a17 or a18 um i know apple tv gaming is kind of a joke but if they they might try to do something there maybe bundle a controller or something i I don't know that would be the killer feature (laughs) yeah a lot of companies have tried this and maybe failed is the wrong word but like remember nvidia had their shield platform with controller and stuff they don't sell it really anymore Mm -hmm. um but in the next year or two we'll see all the phones get this capability apple tv potentially um even more the ipads will just keep getting m1 as their kind of like base spec or higher like right now most of them have it but the budget ones are still like a14 or a13 i think yeah Um, and then max will keep marching on with m3 m4 eventually um so yeah, like right now it's like a decent, but like not all of our audience can enjoy this. And in a couple of years, it'll be like everybody can enjoy these games. Mm, mm-hmm. That's a good point, right? Because the I think the original um, thrust of our proposal years ago was a matter of saturation. 
Like, mm-hmm. okay, the tech is here, but it has to be the bottom tier baseline to build upon. Like mm-hmm. everyone has it. So I found that interesting that the Silicon's come along and largely done that, you know, and been quite successful. Um, they're selling lots of the M1 machines, at least laptops, I guess. I don't know how well the desktops are selling. Um, that's still like a like 30 inch iMac or whatever. That's an M2 or M3 or something. Um, but now they're just starting with the phones. I almost feel like it's not restarting the process, but I guess it's in an inescapable part of the Apple ecosystem. Like you're saying, Apple, like, oh, selling so many units on Apple rather than dividing it into like iPad or iPhone or a Mac. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess maybe it'll take like a critical mass of all three, let's call them all three platforms or all three device segments, whatever the word is to sort of have equilibrium as a foundation, then maybe that'll be the real launch pad. Like Sam was saying in the next 12 to 24 months. Yeah. The, the interesting thing, I don't know if they'll do this, but it's just like, if I was in charge of like marketing Apple or it's not marketing Apple marketing gaming at Apple, you could do some interesting stuff where you could market like Assassin's Creed Mirage, like I'm playing on the subway or whatever, that very Nintendo Switch-esque commercial. And <laughs> then you could like show them like getting home and opening up their MacBook Air. And it's just like, I, now I'm picking up where I left off on my iPhone. My, my, I was cross save. I'm immediately playing my MacBook Air. And then like, oh, I don't want to play this anymore. I close it up, go to my TV, turn on my Apple TV. It's like, oh, there's my AC Mirage. Um, they could do something very like, switch esque where it's like i don't i don't think anybody would actually do that but people love that yeah but that switch commercial when the switch got announced where they're like playing on like the rooftop it's like nobody does that but yeah i know <laughs> people love that image of like having a smash bro party in direct mm-hmm. sunlight on the roof of the skyscraper <laughs> <laughs> i mean like when, when i bought my 16 inch macbook pro i was walking around thinking hey and then i can play games on the go and i'm, I'm, I'm still just playing on my 27 inch iMac because it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, why why would i right <laughs> um, yeah. but like it, there's also the fact that like so i agree, entirely agree with the fact that you know it'll trickle down it'll eventually the baseline 11th 12th whatever generation baseline ipad will be able to play high-end games as well and it will be super cheap for that sort of thing uh all things considered but there's also the fact that you know if you're buying a dedicated gaming console a switch a steam deck whatever you're paying a bunch of money for just that if you're buying an iphone 15 pro you're getting the phone that you might have bought regardless and the gaming console effectively if it's gonna be you know, reaching that stage of people use it for that. Very interesting point. Yeah. Um, and that's not me trying to be an, an Apple salesperson. I wouldn't pay that much money for the phone. Um, I would wait until it comes to the iPhone 16 baseline or whatever, but there you go. That, that's an argument for why it might make more sense than it yeah. seems. It's very similar. Like I've made that argument in the past, like with, with PC gaming versus console, where it's like you can buy a $500 console and then like if let's say you're a student or you just need a computer and then you go out and buy a $500 like budget computer. Um, and now you have gaming and you have this lame computer or you can just spend a thousand bucks on a computer and have a pretty solid machine that can game and also do all your productivity work mm-hmm. nicer than the $500 budget laptop. But yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of that old PC versus console extended out to the Apple. Ecosystem. Right. For sure. <laughs> No, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that is what's interesting. Um, I mean, I still, like, like we said, we're starting to see not only a glimpse, but like, oh, maybe it's on the shore, starting to land. I do agree it'll take another year or two to really, let's call it fly. Um, I still don't see it ever really competing with the likes of, you know, Steam or, you know, your PlayStations and Xboxes, but I don't think I don't think it needs to compete. It just needs a mm. reasonable level of uh, li- it needs a reasonable game library is what it yeah. needs. It doesn't need every single game in the world. Um, you know. So re- I don't know what to call them. Ma- let's call them mainstream gamers who either are on a major console or they're on Steam. Well, mm-hmm. that's what I'm categorizing them as. Um, you know, they're enticed by certain things. They like exclusives. They like ultra high-end games. They like this, they like that. So, you know, Epic has got a particular strategy of trying to do like, oh, this is a six to 12 month exclusive to the Epic store to try to like get people to use their platform. So what I'm getting at is like, what does Apple need to do 
in particular to get gamers to use their platform. Well, maybe they don't really need to do anything. Maybe it's they just use their inbuilt audience, like Casper was saying. I'm already going to buy this device anyway if you're into Apple hardware or I want a tablet or I want a phone or I want a laptop or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's just sort of this organic, again, Trojan horsey um, saturation of gaming that's more like a gentle creeping in or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I, the, just because of what you said about how they're, they're not going to fully compete, they're never going to be like 100% uh, game coverage effectively um you're not never going to get someone whose main thing the only thing they care about is games who they're never going to like look at the mac and go well i could have bought a playstation or a pc i'm gonna buy a mac because <laughs> they don't have 100 percent coverage right not all the games are there but if you're looking at someone who's on the fence about apple the more games that exist on the platform where they're like well i, I would have bought a mac but it couldn't play insert game here you could sway more of those people just by the virtue of more games existing on the Mac. I don't think they need exclusivity deals or something. It's effectively like um, the DLSS versus FSR thing. Like NVIDIA is in front with DLSS for the upscaling up thing, right? Um, so FSR exists on AMD not to be a selling point, but to reduce the value of NVIDIA's selling point with DLSS to close the gap a little. And I think that's effectively what Apple needs to do on mm-hmm. gaming to make the Apple platforms more compelling to people who care about gaming. Just they don't need to win everywhere. They just need to close the gap to make more of the people go, yeah, Mac is good enough. It does these other things better, so I prefer it. And now it can also do gaming good enough that I'm I'm willing to sacrifice the bits of gaming it doesn't do yet. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think if they can get like every well well, to make things simple we'll just say every third or fourth highly reviewed game i like not i don't literally mean that but like Baldur's gate 3 for this fall is a good example one of the top rated pc games of all time it's on mac um so that's one less title where people go like oh i heard crazy things about this game maybe maybe i haven't booted up a game on a pc or a mac in, in a decade but you hear about you remember playing Baldur's gate 2 and you were like 16 or something and then you hear about how amazing this one is you're like oh let's buy it and if it wasn't on mac os then you're like ah yeah same thing with like those really those mo- esports titles like league of legends or csgo or, or i guess it's counter-strike 2 now um actually i think counter-strike dropped mac support that they did it's on the um, list of uh, topics yeah. <laughs> yeah. but if they if they can get those games that like like counter-strike and league of legends they're never they're not like high marketing titles like because they've been out for years Nobody cares about them. I'm saying that in quotation marks, like in terms of like the media, but millions and millions of players care about them. And they don't care about the latest AAA game that's a flash in a pan for marketing for a month and then it's on to the next AAA game. They care about like, I've been playing CSGO for 10 years and I'm going to keep playing for the next 10 years. Um, they, I think they really need to focus on those games plus the odd like Metacritic gem, mm-hmm. um, like Baldur's right. Gate 3 and stuff like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm like, I was just messaging my buddy this morning who also has a Mac and a PC. And I'm like, you know, if they just added like cyberpunk in the next year, you know, I'd maybe I'd buy like an M3 for gaming rather than just productivity. Like Baldur's Gate 3, um, Sam and I, we should do it like a full review episode. I played like 40, 50 hours of it. You said you played 80. Casper, I don't think you've played yet, but you have it pending. Lily has a code, but she's too darn busy with the army ruining her life i'm saying that sarcastically but because she's been saying really funny stuff on our server um some lt giving her giving her a hard time about ammo supplies or something but anyway (laughs) um as cash was just saying i don't need every single game ever i just want certain games available like obviously i have a particular bias towards cyberpunk but it's a very popular game Mm -hmm. and it's not even multiplayer so i think that's another facet what sam was just saying these games that have like huge, I don't know what to call them, shelf life, digital life, your your Dotas, your League of Legends, your, your Counter-Strikes, they just go for years and years and years. I know people I met 10 years ago who are still playing Dota 2 just as hard as they were 10 years ago. I've long moved on, even though mm-hmm. I played it a ton. I have like two and a half thousand hours into it or something. I look at them now, they're at like 10, 15,000 hours. And I'm like, holy sh- crap, <laughs> yeah. are we still playing this game? But they're in there just every day and they're five-man parties. They're having a good time. I mean, 
they're having a good time half the time. Half the time of half the part of MOBAs is being angry and frustrated and salty. But the point is, it doesn't really matter. The point is, they're still playing the same game. And there's the same people have been playing Counter Strike for like 20 years. They're just Mm -hmm. hardcore. And it's too bad um, Counter Strike 2 dropped Max of I doubt that's permanent. I would be surprised if it was. Yeah. So a few points there. Like I saw someone who wrote like an angry thumbs down review thing who said, like, um, I have 4,000 hours in this game on my Mac. I've spent $500 on inventory items. And you just forced an update on me from Counter-Strike Go. That means I can't run it on my Mac anymore. That sucks. Um, And sympathies to that person. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Also, but like there, there is some workaround where you can like downgrade back to CSGO. Google that if you're affected by this. Um, but also, like, um, what was I thinking? Right. So you, you said you don't think it's permanent. Um, they have an FAQ page, which is the only place where they even mentioned that it was dropping Mac support after the fact, after they pushed the update on people, um, mm. where it just says, is this game available on Mac? Nope, not right now, basically. Um, right. But they have done some, so there's, like, that steep Steam Depot, like, database, effectively, that, like, yeah. lists the files available. Uh, there was some files being uploaded to the um, the Mac side of the Steam database, um, but like they also did upload the Windows files to the Mac database, so it did download the update mm. on Macs, and the Mac tries to boot Windows executable. And it, it's almost right. like they forgot the Mac existed and just pushed the Windows files everywhere. It's so weird. I was really su- like surprised at Valve's handling that launch. Like the Mac side of things is really unfortunate, but even ignoring that i feel like they did a really poor launch like yeah. they essentially deleted csgo yeah. people who had hundreds of achievements in that game all their achievements got deleted legit like gone from your steam profile like there's no record that you played csgo or like yeah. just gone um whereas like the old counter strikes like they all exist still like counter strike source and um counter strike and like all those old ones it, it seems especially the achievement thing like most people don't care about achievements but people who do care about achievements really care about achievements. Mm-hmm. And to just like delete those is like really egregious and shows like a really tone deaf attitude yeah. towards like a very small, but like very vocal minority of, of gamers who are, I think, well, justifiably yeah. into Ultimately, achievements. Ultimately, it's not handling of what is, has been for a while, like the number one selling and most played game on Steam for like for years. I mean, Dota 2 was like, they were going back and forth a while and like a cyberpunk launch, I think topped it, but on and off, but like consistently it's been one of the most, if not the most played game on steam and all that stuff. So it's, it's odd. And especially since valve is they handle the platform and the game. There's like, it's not like someone interfered <laughs> with their launch. It's, it's all on them. Uh, it's definitely weird. I don't play the game. CS2 looks cool, but it, it, it's not cool without any warning to just force an update. It's kind of like the unity thing, like ta-da surprise rug pull. Ha ha. You know, yeah. Um, it's just, it's not cool, you know, and especially there's no reason like yeah. Valve couldn't have done it a little smoother, a little nicer, at least warned users, couple, like Christ, warn them a week in advance. Hey, Mac users and whoever else or achievement hunters, all this is going away, you know? I mean, just maybe, put it as a separate title on Steam. Don't overwrite CSGO like that. Yeah, like, are people really going to punch in like, hey guys, Let's play Counter Strike. Well, just make it so when you punch in Counter Strike, Counter Strike Two is the first search. Exactly. Like, yeah. You know, is anyone really going to look at the older game first? I mean, they might, but like personally, when I go look at a game, I always look at the sequel first because typically it's newer. In theory, it's like more features, a more improved or more polished gameplay or whatever. Not always the case, but in theory, mm-hmm. um, it's like I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. if someone has CS:GO in their library, put CS:2 in there as well. And then when they launch CSGO, put up a message saying CS2 is available. Yep. And right. you could even go as far as like, if you want to play competitive, you need to go to CS2, but you can still play casual and deathmatch and like uh, all your right. all your custom server games all, still all right. on CSGO. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It's too bad. Um, we do need, well, I need to wrap it up here in maybe five, five or 10 minutes, but um, <clears throat> Baldur's Gate 3 is worth mentioning. It is now out, finally out on Mac. So no more early access only stuff. Um, early access stuff never carried over, so there was no real reason to keep playing it unless you're really diehard about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it released tw- in the last week or five days or something. Uh, I haven't tried it on my Mac yet. The The release version, I've tried the early access version ages ago, and it ran great on my mm-hmm. iMac. 
Um, I did test it on my M1 Air way back. I don't have that anymore. I haven't tried it on this machine, which is my MacBook Pro, M1 Pro or whatever. Um, but the game's insanely good. It deserves its accolades, its praise. It's like in said like top two to three status on the Steam charts, or I think it was number one for a bit. Um, and it's like nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 reviews everywhere. It's an insanely ambitious, impressive RPG, and it deserves like a full episode review from Sam and I and whoever wants to join in. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll um I'll save my longer thoughts for whatever that inevitable review episode will be. But what else? What I will say quickly is is I I absolutely love the game. I have eighty hours on it, and and I don't I don't have a ton of time to game. And I intentionally was not going to buy this game because it was so long. Mm. I ended up caving when I saw the 97 on Metacritic and then <laughs> thinking like, oh, I'll play it for three hours and then not, never play it again. Um, I, eight, here I am 80 hours later. But the other thing I'll say as like a, a testimonial to how good it is, is like I'm someone who probably hasn't beaten a single player game in probably over 10 years. I, I love my competitive multiplayer. I love like I played a ton of League. I was playing Valorant. I was playing Counter-Strike. Mm-hmm. Um, and a single player game has not been able to hook me for at least a decade like like i've, I've played them and i appreciate them but i've never been able to like 80 hours into or destiny 2 is playing a ton of not single player either mm-hmm. um baller's gate 3 i think is the best game i've ever played in my life um it's just the attention to detail and like um it's just so good i'm uh, just started act three so i won't say any spoilers here but mm. it's yeah it's just incredible so like i'm saying this to someone who's never played a crpg well, I have played them when I was like 10. I'm not like a CRPG <laughs> fan. I'm not typically someone who goes for single player games and I like it this much. Um, that's nice. how good of a game it is. Nice. It does live up to the hype. Obviously, there will people would be like, no, it doesn't. Broadly speaking, majority, yeah. it lives yeah. up to the hype. Um, I don't even like, I've mucked around. Um, I was very hesitant about um mucking around to like D systems front and center rather than being in the background like divinity original sin and stuff um but it, it just works the game really is basically it's that good that's the summary um nice. i don't think you need to be a fan of the genre i don't think you need to be a fan of D. you just need to be a fan of a very uh character driven adventure because that's really what it is yeah and the game you know and just son of sort of an open world I won't say like creative sandbox, but like almost creative sandbox. Um, it's a pretty astonishing accomplishment by Larian. That was the subject of our last episode. Casper and I like this. It spawned this great quality debate that raged for a week or two on on media and Twitter and wherever else, social media and whatever, mm-hmm. YouTube, I guess. Um, so what's interesting, and I find this a little bit about, this is almost maybe worth its own episode too, but like, so <clears throat> um, Baldur's Gate 3 wasn't early access for three years. That's a fact. And what's also a fact is they had like a million sales in their first month or two or something crazy. So that obviously helps give them a lot of confidence and like development time. Mm -hmm. I think Larian is roughly 300 odd people, but they hired like an extra 300 odd people to do voice acting and mocap and all this other related stuff. Um, So it was ultimately made by like around 600 people. And then we have something like Cyberpunk 2077, which was released about three years ago. Also, I don't know if it's over the mark or under. But it, the update they just put out, 2.0, not the expansion, just the update. It's basically the game as it should have been on launch, but three years later. So I guess it's interesting to me. Of course, Cyberpunk didn't have early access. The game was good. It was just never great. Now it's great. So it's like, I guess, is it like, obviously not. So you can't just give any studio enough time and money and they will just produce a great game. That's not true. Like there has to be some sort of talent, vision, creative force, like, uh, to to output something like oh everyone's gonna go oh my god and lose their minds over um i guess i'm just rambling like do do these big games just need more time <laughs> a lot of the time i think yeah <laughs> yeah and i hope they take the time i guess is what i'm getting at rather than shoving it out the door and like we'll patch it over years and years and years and years and years you know mm. yeah just just a, that could go on but i'll stop there yeah just mm. a yeah, I, the last thing I forgot to mention for Baldur's Gate is just the more of the mass specific stuff. Um, I tried it out my M1 Air. Uh-huh. I haven't, I haven't played it since the official 1.0 on Mac on my Air. Like I played the game, but not on my Mac. Um, it ran fine. 
like not great but not terrible and it's also the kind of game it's turn-based like if it's running at 15 fps that's fine it's a top-down turn-based rpg um so i think steam has a pretty good refund policy so if anybody listening i would if you're at all interested buy it try it for an hour if you don't like it refund it on steam yeah i think uh, you have two hours on steam before you uh two hours or two weeks or whatever combination Yeah. yeah yeah Um, one final little quick comment before we wrap up since john's gotta leave um the new release of crossover has come out um it requires at least for one of the toggles mac os sonoma Uh, mac os sonoma also has game mode pretty big thing we could talk about that at some point um and yeah it's that's released um but with the new crossover and i did not think apple's license permits this but i don't think code weavers would do it if they didn't have some way of having legal rights to this it includes the game porting toolkit. Oh, like cool. Apple's license says something about like you need to be a developer making a game and all this thing. But yeah, it's in there. Um, you can use Apple's game porting toolkit directly from Crossover now. Um, and to make matters even better for Mac gaming through Crossover, the new update supports the Nuvo. Um, so even games with DRM, you can boot them with Crossover now. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's great news. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I got a I got an email from Crossover about that, and what's funny is they're like Baldur's Gate three. It's like, dude, yeah. that has an official Mac release. Yeah, like, I, I, at the I same time. looked at that too, thinking, what the fuck? Why are you mentioning yeah. that one? <laughs> exactly. But yeah, there, there were it's a like lot of other cool ones on the on the list too, like Mortal Kombat one, which is brand new Mortal, Mortal Kombat, Kombat one, Diablo four, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's not actually Mortal Kombat one. It's like Mortal Kombat fifteen, but they're renaming it. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's it's cool. Just more options, more Mac gaming goodness. I haven't dived into the um, alternative methods to game on Mac in quite a while. Mm. Crossover, parallels, and so on. Um, or uh, what is it? G- game porting it? GPK, which makes it sound like a currency to me. Uh, <laughs> currency abbreviation. Mm. Um, but that's really cool. Yeah. Um, Code Weavers also, I think, has a, some sort of trial, one or two weeks or something. Um, mm. So no reason to not just give that a whirl, too. Yeah, and I mean, like, you can install Game Porting Toolkit without crossover. Um, it's meant for developers. The instructions to the average person might be a bit difficult. You need to install Homebrew and install a bunch of packages yourself. And yeah, it requires the command line extensively. With it now being built into code, where the crossover, it's as simple as, you know, putting something in your applications folder and there you go. You can use Game Porting Toolkit. toolkit. And it has been updated as well. Um, so. It works even better now. Um, better performance, more game compatibility, all that jazz. So, yeah. Worth a look. Check it out. Yeah, no, things are just on the up and up. There's a deluge of cool stuff. And uh, in the future, yeah, we can try to talk more about that. Maybe we'll tinker with it ourselves or we can reference like YouTube videos. There's always some reliable people doing it there. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, we'll have a, I don't know how in the near future, but hopefully in the near future, we'll have a dedicated Baldur's Gate 3 uh, episode because it's worth getting into broadly speaking and then maybe like a, towards the end a spoiler section or something um something like that i think that's how we've done our reviews in the past um, yeah yeah so yeah we'll wrap it up here for today great episode a lot of cool stuff great things happening in the mac space or in the uh, let's call it the apple space because it is collective now phone ipad mac stuff mm-hmm. uh yeah so great games out great games coming more on the way Let's see what happens. So thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to Casper and Sam for all your awesome commentary. And we'll catch you guys next time. Cheerio. See you later. Bye, Bowlers Gate 3. (laughs) (laughs) Do (laughs) eat.